the world of Pugmire is set far in the future of our world. At some point in time between now and the, the, the ancient future, humanity has gone somewhere. We don't know what happened to them. But we have left animals behind and they've been uplifted. Uh, they can stand on two legs, they can manipulate tools, they can speak to each other. And it is these characters that we are portraying today. We are going to use these characters to explore this strange abandoned world and find adventure and mystery and intrigue. But right at this exact moment, it's raining. Because strangely, it always seems to rain at funerals. And this funeral in particular is heartbreaking for all three of you. Uh, this is the funeral of Marion Maltese. Uh, she was a dog that meant a lot of each to you, and she died quite suddenly and, and quite mysteriously. And as the uh, rain patters off of the gravestone with her name emblazoned on it, you remember that she was a scholar, an explorer, and a shepherd. Uh, shepherds are those that belongs to the Church of Man, the faith that humanity watches over dogs and cares for them. So as the uh, shepherd stands up, he starts to speak and intone, Good dogs, you are gathered here today. We have come to celebrate and to mourn the loss of Marion Maltese. And his voice starts to fade away. It's not that you're not paying attention, but you're still overwhelmed with the suddenness of the loss. And so I'm going to start with each one of you and ask, tell me a, a piece of what your character remembers or what your character is missing from the loss of Marion Maltese. And we'll start with uh, Sister Buster Mutt. Well, Sister Marion was just accepted me and invited me in even though I wasn't who I said I was and she must have known but she welcomed me into the fold and encouraged me and so now she's gone this bedrock of support and love is just gone forever and that just hurts you reflect and remember all of the times that she sat with you and held your paw and encouraged you, particularly when people were critical of, of your background and your path and journey into the, the Church of Man. And we will move now to uh, Rex Pyrenees and what Rex is thinking. Marion Maltese was my inspiration, but more than that, she was my conscience. And in a world that no longer contains Marion Maltese, I I don't know who I am, and I don't know that I trust myself to be the dog that she always thought I could be. Rex reflects on the loss of a moral compass in his life and what that means as we move into the mind of Saturani Papillon and what his reflections are. Well, she was a very good dog, a very good dog indeed, and she will be missed. She helped people much like myself, and we were able to help each other at times, I suppose. It was a very strange first meeting, I have to confess. I had to have a bit of an encounter with a rather unpleasant beast. I wasn't really sure what it was at the time, but she seems to know what it was, and know how to, uh, well, kill it, which is what I did. Um, which is fine, because then that helped her out, and it helped me out. And then ever since then, well, you know, she's given me help a few times. After all, sometimes I can't go to the normal places one goes to heal one's wounds, because I'm in a bit of trouble with the law <laughs> and all that, but she she always helped me out when I needed to lay low, and that was appreciated. After all, some people maybe think I'm not a very good dog, but well, I'm trying. I'm trying. It's just sometimes the lines between who's a good dog and who isn't is awfully complicated. Far too complicated than I'd like. You reflect on the fact that Miriam Maltese was definitely a dog that saw the inner goodness of dogs, perhaps sometimes even willing to broach or stray against the law itself to make sure that dogs got what they needed to survive and to progress on their own unique paths. 
and your mind starts to clear as you hear the shepherds start to wind down and it settles with kind of the sonorous amen. And he touches his nose, which many of you know is the uh, way that the Church of Man shows respect. And just like that, it seems like a lifetime is, is wrapped up in a short speech in the rain. Some of the dogs wander off. The three of you are thinking your own thoughts. And the three of you have worked together in the past, uh, both occasionally with Mary and more without her, but you've worked as, as what are known as pioneers, those dogs that explore the strange places in the world and bring back lost knowledge, lost artifacts, rescue people. To many, you are seen as heroes. To some, you are used as tools. But all of you at least try in your best to be as good as you can. Uh, and so the three of you are lost in your own thoughts when you realize that there's still one other dog remaining. A short dog wearing a, a dark purple robe and hood. Uh, seems to be kind of staring into the hole in the ground. And then he turns to look at the three of you and Rex suddenly realizes that he knows his dog. Uh, this is Prince Mura Pug. He is the Seneschal of Pugmire, the brother of the King of Pugmire. And he is by himself. There are no guards. There's no entourage. He's simply here, quietly paying respects. Well, I certainly know better than to blow his cover. So there's a moment of startlement from Rex. Just a flick of an ear and kind of an alertness. And I make eye contact with the prince. He locks eyes with you and then there's uh, a small nod, uh, almost out of appreciation for your reserve. Uh, but then he makes his way over and he says, good dogs, thank you for coming. Uh, I can see from your faces that Marion meant perhaps as much to you as, as she did to me as a friend. I would ask a favor, although perhaps, and he gestures towards the sky, perhaps this is a conversation best held in drier climates. And you can see he is an older pug. Uh, black fur is peppered with gray across his face, across his muzzle. But as he moves his paws around and gestures as he walks, uh, he walks with the grace of a younger dog. Uh, he moves slowly. His movements are perhaps a little stiff, but there's no stumbling. There's no twitching. There's no outpouring of pain. This is a dog who is in control of himself. And he starts to walk towards uh, a carriage. You can see a little further away from the grave site. And it is nondescript carriage. There's no ornamentation, uh, but it's large. It, it, it's easily enough to hold four dogs inside comfortably. Uh, there are a couple of, of horses. Horses are not uplifted, so these are just normal pack animals. Uh, waiting patiently by the side of the road under a tree so they're not rained on. And as you make your way into the carriage, uh, it is definitely drier. Uh, it is not as, as wet in here. And it is surprisingly warm, especially considering it is a, a, a chilly winter. You suspect it might be a small magical flourish, perhaps on Murrow's behalf, perhaps another dog casts a spell at some point. Uh, but it is certainly comfortable. And uh, Murrah resists the urge to shake. His fur is beating with water, but you can see that he's trying not to shake his fur. But he does ease off his robe, or his hood. He says, I am sure you have heard that Marion Maltese died under mysterious circumstances. And I feel that as 
both pioneers and friends, you deserve to know something about those. And then I will perhaps have a favor to ask. He reaches into his robe and pulls out a, a journal, a leather-bound journal. Uh, it looks a little waterlogged, uh, very well loved. You can see that it is uh, brimming like only old used journals can be. Uh, that it's almost like a little too big for its binding, uh, but it is wrapped closed with a leather strap. Mary was found dead at the foot of the mountains to the north. She went off to investigate rumors of a, a strange tower uh, when her body was discovered. They only found two things. They found this journal and that her holy symbol, the symbol of man, was missing. Something that she carried with her everywhere. I have glanced at the journal and what I find in there disturbs me. I fear that she may have uncovered something, something very powerful. And as some of you may know, our relationships with the cat monarchies have been deteriorating as of late. I would wish to believe that maybe she simply fell foul of an accident, but I cannot discount the fact that cats may have had something to do with her death. So I want to ask the three of you, with your unique skills, if you would be willing to look over the journal, learn what you can, retrace her steps, and if nothing else, reclaim her simple. It is an item of some magical as well as emotional importance to the Church of Man. But it would show that her accident was just that. If her symbol is missing, it would send a message that perhaps there was more malicious political intent behind her demise. I would like to know either way. I would go to the ends of the earth for that dog. Going to the mountains and retrieving a holy symbol is nothing. It's the least, the very least we can do for her memory. Yeah, let's... What are we waiting for? I agree we should head out as soon as possible, especially if there is some unpleasant activity happening. Well, that needs to be dealt with, I, I think. And I try and wring out my very fluffy ears. I can resist shaking entirely, but I can't resist trying to make those ears a little less wet. So you talk and you're trying to wring your ears out, but you don't quite time the sentence right. So there's you, you, you finish your sentence and there's a kind of last little loud splotch of water as it hits the wood floor. And, and Mura, to his credit, just pretends like it never happened. Which suits me just fine. I like this prince already. Uh, he hands uh, the journal to uh, Sister Mutt uh, and says... Then feel free to use this carriage to take you back to Pugmire. Um, I have another transport waiting for me. If you need any plastic or supplies before your travels, simply let me know and come to the castle and I will make sure they're presented to you. But otherwise, I wish you well and look forward to your information. And then he steps out of the carriage. Uh, I hold the journal um, as closely to me, knowing that I'm f fully soaked <laughs> as I can without damaging it. Do you open it up? Yes. I'll open up the journal and see what is so disturbing in our beloved sister's um, notes. You start to read, and the carriage actually moves forward as you're reading. Uh, the journal is densely packed with information. There's lots of, of sketches and notes. Uh, if you remember um, Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, uh, the journal that was present in that movie, it's very much like that. Or really, this is a lot of movies, that journal, like there's lots of pictures as well as text around it. it it's, that, it's that kind of free-flowing artistic journal. Uh, and it honestly reminds you a bit of Marion to a degree. Uh, there's a bit of, of artistic flair in, in her sketches. And the first half of the journal are pretty mundane information. Uh, uncovered uh, ancient 
man language that she was transcribing uh, and then ultimately translating uh, some sketches of some of the people around the church as she was staying in practice with her artistic skills. But then nearer to the end, uh, the writing gets a little more intense. Uh, the, the picture is a little more shadowy. And you start to see references to something called an oilia font. Uh, if you have uh, arcana, no arcana or no religion as a skill, you can make an intelligence roll. Any of you can. Uh, I have no religion. Um, difficulty is 12. So you roll d20, add your intelligence, and then add plus one because you have the skill. All right. Well, that's a good start. Uh, so 19 plus 3, so that is 22. Aeliophants are mythical creatures. Uh, no dog of repute has heard of them. Certainly, braggarts and drunkards have talked about seeing pink Aeliophants flying through the air, but most people discount them. Uh, what you know about them and what this text seems to be supporting, based on the sketches that you've seen, uh, is that they are large creatures. Uh, they have six limbs, they have a long trunk, they have razor-sharp tusks that seem to curl from their mouths. The other thing that you remember uh, that isn't spelled out in the journal, but you see kind of continued references to, is that there's something about oily offense and the mind, or the loss of the mind, something like that. You can't quite remember exactly what. Um, but there's man had some kind of special place for oleophants, and that place involved the mind. So it was one of those creatures that lots of scholars are always pursuing. It's, it's like the Pokemon equivalent of, say, a Bigfoot. Always trying to find information about, trying to chase, and you never quite find. Marion became particularly obsessed with oleophants and believed she found a tower in the mountains that contains an oily font. I lean over as uh, the sister is reading the book, poking my nose ever so slightly over her shoulder and say, well, uh, sister, what does it say? Uh, any clues? Uh, any, any, any leads to, to, to who the ruffians are we need to, to defeat? Sister Marion thinks that she found a tower with oily fonts in it. Oh! Oh no! Uh, uh, what, what, what? Rex, what, what's an oily font? You know, if that was in anyone else's journal, I would say they were a drunkard. Sister, are they? Are those even real? Really real? Well, S Sister Marion seems to think that they are. Uh, I've never seen one or heard of anyone seeing one, but if she believes that this... there was one inside of a tower, then... There must be one. She's not that sort of dog. All right. So there's an elephant in a tower. Uh, okay. Hmm. But, but why? Why is it in a tower? We don't know what man did with these things, but something involving the mind. And if it's that big of a secret that someone might do harm to our dear sister. Or take her symbol. It has to be something big. Hmm. All right then. Well, I guess I guess we need to hmm, go, go, get, get to this tower and see if there is anything that we can see. Maybe some clues left from what happened. Satrani, so, as you were kind of leaning over and looking at the uh, text, something scratches the back of your mind. Um, something from your days when you were a noble getting in trouble uh, with other dogs of your family. Make an intelligence roll for me. That is a 20 to 21. So there are some notes in the margins and they're, 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 they're particularly florid and graceful. And initially, you're exp again, Mary was a very, was an artistic soul to some level and you're not surprised by that. But then you realized... You remember something about uh, when some of your noble uh, peers and friends 
would try to sneak messages to one another. They would sometimes use poetry as a way to disguise the information. Uh, and so you start actually reading not the words themselves, but kind of between the words and where the letters are lining up. And you uncover a disturbing message. And this may be the thing that Murr was referring to as a fellow noble. But over and over on several pages, you notice the phrase, an oleophant must never forget. My nose begins to shake a little in excitement as I start seeing this hidden message. And I, I lean forward and I prod Sister Buster very hard, as I often do. I get too excited sometimes. Hey, Sister, look, 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 wait, 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 look at that. You see those words there? That That's, hang on, I've seen this before. I think this is some sort of code. Uh, hang on. Uh, okay, there's oil. The oily front must never forget. Look, he's, it's a hidden message. What does that mean? It must never forget. I guess it mustn't forget. Sounds, sounds a bit sinister, though. Why, why would she have that as a secret message? I'm not sure. They have, they're associated with the mind. Must never forget. We don't know what she wanted the uh, oily font to not forget. Perhaps in the tower when we find one. We'll see what, it's rem- what it has to remember. Yes. Make a note of that, Rex. We need to make sure it remembers. Mental note made. Excellent. How peculiar. Well, I suppose we'd better take this carriage and, and, and go and investigate like as soon as possible. No better time than night. If there are any enemies, it will be easier to uh, it'll be easier for us to sneak about. Are we carrying everything we might need? Well, I have my crossbow, my dagger, and my... Uh, hmm. I don't have any... Oh, actually, no, I do have some rope. <laughs> I do actually have some rope. That's all I need. Oh, uh, we probably should grab some supplies. Oh, I mean, yes, we, we should do that as well, shouldn't we? Well, one thing that the, the Pugmire rules allow, actually, is that um, at the start of an adventure, as long as you're near a location where you can reasonably get equipment, you can just choose one piece of equipment and add it to your rucksack on your character sheet. So if you say, I want to add some rope, you can just say some rope. If I'm okay with it, you can just write down rope. So this, you don't have to spend money. We don't track currency. This is not that kind of game. Uh, so uh, given Mura's... Uh, offer. If there's one piece of equipment you think your character needs for going to adventure, just let me know and we'll go ahead and add it on. Wonderful. Well, then I'd say I have all my fighting equipment, maybe a nice little lantern, some rope, a bag, of course, to carry this all in, and maybe we should uh, get some some food and maybe even some t- a tent or something, just in case we need to camp out. Well, Rex is filling up half a carriage by being a massive dog in plate mail with a great sword. Um, I think it would be unfair of him to take up any more space than he currently does. His equipment looks fine. Yeah, uh, Buster's equipment looks fine as well. We can then uh, uh, move on. You, you could keep the carriage if you like. The, tra- the journey to the mountains is actually uh, well over a week. The mountains are pretty far to the north of Pugmire. Uh, but you... Make the trip relatively uneventfully uh, with the carriage you have on hand. Um, one thing you realize pretty quickly is that there is no driver for the carriage, but the horses do seem to know where they're going. Uh, perhaps more than you do. Who knows? But the several nights go by. Um, the north road is relatively well-traveled. Uh, merchants from the north use it to come down into Pugmire to trade, so it, it's reasonably secure and wide and flat. Uh, so you can simply follow the north road up until you get closer to the craggier areas of the north. Uh, And then there's a point where it's just going to be hard for a carriage and horses to make their way because I think hills are getting higher and it's just harder and harder to to traverse. And at one point in time, the horses just stop and look at you. And you step out of the carriage and one of the horses sneezes and they turn around and walk back down the road. Well, I suppose we continue the way on foot. Not entirely sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So you're going to make way to your mountains. Um, as I mentioned before, it is uh, winter, and the mountains are themselves already cold. Uh, we're just going to say, for narrative purposes, you have uh, clothing on top of your fur, although Rex is already pretty furry as a Pyrenees to begin with, so Rex is probably doing pretty okay in this weather to begin with. 
uh, the road into the mountains, according to um, the notes you have, uh, at first start off pretty straightforward. Um, there's a, a minor road into the mountains that, that's not level, but relatively clear of obstruction. And then uh, at that point, the notes become a little more specific and you realize that we're now moving into an area that's not easily found. Uh, as you're walking down the road, for example, uh, you get a sense of the notes say, check the walls to the left. And at one point in time, the wall will disappear, which seems, again, like f- maybe a little florid prose. But what actually happens is the way the rocks are lined up. If you're walking towards it on the left side, it looks like it's just part of the cliff. But then as you walk past, it actually cuts back and it's an optical illusion. You can see there's actually a hidden path on the other side of the wall. But it's also covered in snow and ice. Uh, So I'm going to have to ask you to make uh, constitution checks. If you have the traverse skill, you can add that plus one to your roll. Difficulty is 12. I rolled a nine. Oh, man, and I rolled a four. I rolled a natural 20. I will say as a natural 20, you can actually grab one of your two companions who are starting to slip. Which one is your friend? Which one do you love more? As a good dog, I naturally choose Sister Buster. Zadrini, there are there still is two fortune in the pool. Uh, if you'd like to, if the group is amenable, you can spend one to try to re-roll your roll to see if you can do better. Very well, then. If the group is fine with it, I will use one fortune from our fortune pool to re-roll that seven, <laughs> ten. As you're trying to make your way down the path, um, there's like a kind of steep incline, um, and uh, Rex kind of sees where this is going and actually digs their heels in a little bit to try to balance, and then was able to kind of quickly reach a paw out to grab Sister Mutt as she starts to slide away. Uh, Zetrani does an amazing backflip back to try to grab Rex or the rock or something, but it, it's just a hair away. Your paw manages to just miss both, and you land face first into the snow and then start to slide down a path. Quick, quick, the rope, the rope! Are you going to throw the rope? Uh, yes, I quickly try and reach into my pack and throw the rope and eat towards my friends. Okay, uh, you can make a dexterity roll, but you have to make it at disadvantage, which means you have to roll 2d20s and choose the lower of the results. Difficulty is 10, however. F- 14. Okay. So as you're going towards the edge, your, your paws start to slip off. You manage to throw one end of the rope or two, and Rex grabs it, and with considerable strength, arrests your fall. So basically, you, just, now you kind of slide off the end and then poof, slam right into the, the, the rock, but you're hanging now in space. And you're able to kind of claw back up through the snow onto the edge of the cliff, probably panting heavily. I am definitely panting heavily. I shake myself off, snow flying everywhere, and say, it's okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Elegant as always, Saturini. Yes, thank you, Rex. Uh, it's rather slippery. Uh, watch out, sister. It's very, very slippery down there. It's covered in snow. It's in your eyes, it's in your nose. And as you're trying to get the snow off of you, uh, all of you look over the, the cliff and you see there's actually is a, a, a path along the side of the cliff. It wanders back and forth. It, it's like a goat path. It's barely wide enough for a goat to possibly make its way down. But at the bottom, you see a tall black tower. It's, it's almost like it's made of, of onyx. Hmm. Well, what, what do you make of that, Sister Buster? This is how unusual. Why would they build a tower out here? Middle of nowhere. Uh, that's to hide stuff. Oh, yes. Hidden tower, yes. Perilous path. How dartedly. Uh, uh, well, let's continue. R- Rex, maybe you should lead the way, and, and, and maybe we I could tie this rope to, to you, maybe. Friends, if I lead the way, if anyone falls down, you're going to stop when you hit me. Oh, I suppose that's true. Well, all right then, let's just be careful and, and let's advance on this tower. All right, my lovelies, let me get ahead and yeah, I will lead the way. So uh, I'm just going to say that uh, between your planning um, and Rex's just considerable strength and, and determinedness, you start to make your way down and you're, you're careful, you're like using ropes and, and Rex is like, every time there's a, a shift, Rex is like, stop. And we'll wait for a second until the shift kind of stops, the, the snow settles and you can move again. You're about halfway down the cliff when Rex 
notices there's some movements at the base of the tower. When you were first standing there, you thought the tower was actually pretty far away. This is kind of just background noise, but you're still focused on getting down the path. So, when, And then when you're halfway down, you kind of took a breather to look again. You see that there are some shapes moving at the base of it, but if the scale of the shapes are equivalent to your scale, this tower is surprisingly thin. It's actually a lot closer than it looked at first. More of a needle. Or a very tall tree. Hmm, all I know is I don't like it. Seems suspicious to me. I'm going to try and stiff ahead a little and see if I can be sneaky here, making sure there's no one else around. I, I don't think there is, but just in case. You can go ahead and make a dexterity roll. Do you have sneak as a skill? I do. Okay, you can add plus one. And I'll let you roll the advantage because your friends have been helping you to very carefully get down here, so you've gotten a good sense of how to kind of blend in with it. Plus, also, you're covered in snow, so it's going to be also harder to see you on the edge of the cliff. Good thing I had advantage, because that made that a 16. Satriani skitters on ahead. Rex kind of keeps an eye, and Sister Mud is just kind of praying quietly. Uh, but you make your way further and further down, and you can see, now that you've gotten closer, that uh, there's actually, it looks like it's a, it's a very rudimentary camp. Like, two tents, and what probably was a fire pit, although it's snowed over. And you can make out three people wandering around the camp. Stand, and it's camped nearby the, the temple. They are cats, you can see from this distance. One's got black fur, one's kind of an orange tabby colored, and one has white fur. Beyond that, you can't tell much. You can tell they're armored and armed, but you can't tell much more detail beyond they're still pretty far away. Hmm. I try and hide a little growl, instinctual, at seeing these cats. I knew it. Up to no good. Probably. Hmm, but how to deal with them? I'll go back to the others carefully, quietly, and be like, There's people, there's a camp, there's free, free cats, right outside the tower. It looked armed, ready for trouble, I think. <laughs> They're not ready for us. That's true. What, what do you think? What, what sort of cunning plan can we come up with to defeat these foes? I say we just rush them. That's that, that's good, Rex, that's good. You're good at rushing, but I have a slightly better idea. How about you rush, but I, I can sneak up on one, maybe. Are you okay with this sort of thing? Uh... Well, I think we might need to convince them that they should talk to us to see what's going on, so maybe a light bonking would, would be good. Okay, I think I've got an idea. Just follow, follow my lead, Rex! And... Cutting a gallant pose, I'll attempt to sneak back, but this time I'm going to sneak really close to the camp and try and get behind one of these cats with my crossbow ready. And Sister Mutt is going to just try to keep the bloodshed down to bonking. Is that the, the plan? Yeah, that, that seems to be uh, the best option here, because if we kill them, they're not going to give us any information. As a note, I'm going to give all of you a point of fortune for coming up with a interesting plan that's not just get them which I appreciate. So this is how we're going to manage things. Uh, first, I would like Satriani to make another stealth check. Um, you're no longer at advantage, uh, but uh, your difficulty is going to be 12. Yes, 12. Wonderful. I get 16. Uh, so you kind of carefully drop down and the snow muffles a lot of your sounds. Uh, and there actually, you see there's some pretty large snow drifts nearby the camp, so you use those to kind of skirt around behind. So now you are between the cats and the tower. And as a note, as you get close to the tower, um, your fur starts to stand on end a little bit, particularly around your, your neck and hackles. Uh, and there's a kind of a sound that's just outside the edge of your hearing. Uh, but you don't have time to think about that right now. you got to focus on the, these dastardly cats. Uh, oh, as a note, also, as you get closer, you do see that their armor is uh, very kind of patchwork. Like, there's a, a metal helm, but like a leather breastplate. Another one has uh, studded armor, but some of the studs have, been, have fallen off. So this is old, mismatched armor. Now we will go to Rex, and it sounds like Rex is planning to be the diversion. Um, so you don't have to be a role for that because you're a giant dog and you can do what you like. Uh, so how would you like to attract attention? Can I, however, roll to be 
as intimidating as I deserve to be as I stride into their camp, cloak billowing, hand on my sword. Absolutely. Do you have the intimidate skill? Fortunately, yes. You can use either your strength or your charisma uh, because it skill works for either of those. As charming as he is, he's also massive. We're going to use strength. God almighty, that's an eight. Guys, can I use a fortune point to not embarrass myself? You certainly can, that's fine. That's a 16 on the die, so that's an 18. Rex strides forth. Do you have the sword out, or do you kind of just like more dangerously paw over the pommel? Dangerously close to drawing it. So Strex strides forward, and, and like, you're intentionally like stepping through chunks of ice and frozen bits of snow to get as much, you know, crunch through the snow as much as possible. Uh, and then the three cats shoot at you, and there's that moment of them going for their swords, and then they see you. And then the, the, the winter sun gleams off of your armor, and you curl your lip up in a bit of a snarl. And now they're having second thoughts about that action. Uh, so if Buster would like to step in and start talking, now would be an opportune time. Uh, I'm going to step in and we're going to start talking. As soon as I see Buster step forward, I lean out of my little hidey hole, crossbow, ready, give it a satisfying click, and I just say, Well, friends, I believe we have you surrounded. They turn around and, and, and they're in shock. What is Sister Mutt going to say before we decide if this goes into combat or not? Hello, we're here for it. We're just, we just want to talk. Please, let's... Let's be civilized animals, and we will not, we'll have a conversation at a distance, but we need to have a conversation. We don't need to resort to violence. Let's just stand here and stare at each other and have a conversation. The cat in white fur steps forward and goes, what if we don't want a conversation? Well, then you're going to get an arrow right in the eye, and then one of you is probably going to be eaten by Rex for dinner. So I'd listen to the sister if I were you. The orange cat puts his paw up and says, I don't want to be eaten. You want to be eaten? Do not, do not, do not, do not want to be eaten. I am against eating men. The white cat and white fur goes, shut up, Sam. What do you want? What are you here for? A dear friend of ours died at the base of this tower. My condolences. So we're trying to find her token, and we're also trying to find out how this might have happened how she came to her end. You can make a charisma roll. Um, if you have the persuasion skill, you can use that. Uh, I do have persuade. 12 plus 2, that's 14. As you're talking, you see that the white cat doesn't... seems like he, he's inclined to maybe start something. The two behind him don't look like they're interested in starting a fight. You're starting to sense that maybe there's a, a, a power dynamic here, like maybe the leaders got a little more bravado and needs to prove something, and the other two cats are doing the math of giant dog with sword, giant dog with sword, giant dog with sword. And then the, white, the cat the white fur goes, Was your friend a dog? Would you be surprised if I said yes? No. Just hoping that maybe you had more taste. Was your mother a mangy stray? That's it! He pulls the sword out. Normally, we would roll for initiative at this point in time, but you clearly have the drop on these cats. And most notably, the other two cats are not drawing their weapons. They are, again, giants or with dog. So I will let Rex just start. Um, and as a note, how uh, initiative order works in Pugmire is that rather than going by a strict number order, we only roll the who goes first, or in this case, I have decided who goes first. After that, you get to decide who else in the encounter including the cats, goes next. Once everyone's had a turn, the last person to go will choose who goes first next time. They can choose themselves if they want to. So there's a reason to not have the NPCs go last. So we start with Rex. I would like to draw my sword as if I am going to stick it straight through him and then knock him flat on his ass. Your target number is 12. Um, you will make a strength roll plus one because you are proficient in swords. It's going down. That's a 14. So you pick your sword up and it, it's it, and like in the sun with the way the, the light is distorting, it almost looks like a, a Final Fantasy VII blade. It's just, it, it looks huge in the sun and it just sweeps down and knocks the cat and the cat actually flips over and, and skids into the snow and almost disappears between his white fur and the white snow. Who would you like to go next? 
I'm going to pass the bat on to Saturini. I said I'd shoot him, so I'm shooting him. Uh, I guess I'll try not to kill him, but who knows with a crossbow bolt, eh? Um, so yeah, go ahead and make a uh, dexterity roll plus one, because you are proficient in crossbows. That's a critical hit. What would you like to do to this cat? I shoot him in the eye. That's what I said I'd do. Not my fault he, you know, decided to be unpleasant. He might even have hurt the sister, so I'm sorry. Uh, time to die. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played Tower of the Oliphant for Onyx Path Publishing's Realms of Pugmire. You will find the new edition of Realms of Pugmire live on Kickstarter by following the link in the show notes. Joining Craig for the series was Eddie Webb, Cat Evans, and Kim Godwin. The music was made by Agar Sonus and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody dark ambient for your gaming table. We'd like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon. Martin Hoyshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, Bob Lange, Julian, Cameron, Xavier, and Anton for their generous support. And we'd of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Infinity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember to always be a good dog.